Finally, as some of you may know, it's been my privilege to host Hello Culture and its predecessor, Hello Digital, since its inception in 2008. And um, I thought of a little bit of audience participation to stimulate our thinking. I would share something from that very first conference nine years ago. Uh, we had a speaker, David Rowan of Wired magazine, and he shared what he considered back then to be his top 10 megatrends. And um, I thought I'd share some of them with you and we could kind of take a vote on whether we think he was right. So here's one of, so the first of the trends that he um, shared on the day. Software, he said, is changing the world, changing education and health. Now bear in mind this was 2008, you know, can you remember, two, I, I can barely remember last week. So 2008 was nine years ago. Right, so while you all think about that, anybody here got an eight-year-old child? They didn't exist when, I, when he was talking about this stuff. In the, much in the same way. So, software is eating the world, changing education and health. Software is not just something you buy in a box anymore. Well, that dates it already, doesn't it? Put software in a box. Flight simulator for, mo for Windows. Which comes, or which comes pre-installed on your iPhone. They did have iPhones, I couldn't remember. So, from cryptocurrencies to trees that glow in the dark, it's everywhere and everything. You can't learn without it, you can't get well without it, don't leave home without it. You can't. It's in the car, on the bus, and in the street, and everywhere. So, who thinks that prediction has pretty much come true since 2008? Software is everywhere. It's out the box. Not everybody? Okay. Good, good. Thank you for that. And whatever we think about new technologies, spending a day talking about them is a bit like asking a goldfish to describe the water. Um, they can't, because we find it hard to describe what surrounds us. And in a world where arguably there's more and more claims on our attention, the real value now becomes about time and energy. It's our attention that is more precious than capability or capacity. We carry more computing power around in our pockets on our smartphones than NASA had on its, on, its, uh, on its rockets that went to the moon. So, uh, so when we can see so much and do so much and consume so much and create so much, how do we all break through? That's what some of the things we're going to talk about in our keynote address. Uh, thinking outside the box which will address some thoughts on the, story, on the uh, issue. But first, quick story. So a friend of mine recently moved house and he had some huge packing boxes left over. Um, and one morning his daughter said to him, Daddy, what does thinking outside the box mean? And he, he explained, well, it's when you think beyond the usual solutions, you know, you, you have new thought processes, you're being inventive or something new. And she said, oh. That's why it didn't work. And intrigued, he asked what she was talking about. And it turned out she'd sat in one of the large packing boxes and she thought really, really hard to see if she could end up back in her bedroom. And of course, needless to say, she was unsuccessful, but let's see what she can do in a virtual world. Um, I'd really like to invite Will Saunders, who's creative director of BBC Studios, who's going to share his thinking on taking that software out of the box and seeing what magic we can make. He's floating in a most peculiar way. Can we have a big round of applause for Will Saunders? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to Hello Culture. Now, um, why do they call this Thinking Outside the Box? Well, this is actually an advert that I put in Media Week a few years ago. I really liked it and I ran with it. But also because I believe the opportunity that we have in front of us right now can only be found in understanding the business we're really in. And that opportunity comes from how we respond positively to change. 
So whilst I will be reflecting on some lessons learned, working for the BBC and playing a few videos for you, I want to leave you with that point. I believe that the opportunity that we have in front of us right now can only be found in understanding the business we are really in and the opportunity comes from how we respond positively to change. Now, I'm hoping that I'm not the only person here today who's come from a traditional media business where we know that in that business the world of digital IP is changing everything and I do mean everything. In a world of plenty, the only currency is attention, and attention is what defines media and most forms of cultural engagement. Netflix and Amazon are fighting Hollywood for attention and winning. Facebook, Instagram, and Snap are taking moments away from other media. They have attention. Now, I lead digital business and development for BBC Studios. That's a content creation company with a slate worth around £350 million a year. BBC Studios makes everything from shiny floor shows like Strictly Come Dancing to epic historical dramas like War and Peace. But those of us who work within television know that our competition is now cows photobombing horses in a field <laughs> as much as it is any other television show. But in this new battle for attention, where should you place your bets? Remember when ebooks were a thing? Remember when we were all making vines? If Nokia had really been in the business of connecting people, they would have invented Facebook. And if they had responded positively to change, they would have embraced the app ecosystem developed by Apple and Android that ultimately crushed them. At times of great change, we risk the retreat to high water and falling back on what we know. Nokia knew about phones, they just didn't know what phones would become. Now, I think that the BBC are in the business of story. And the BBC has always evolved its storytelling mission. First, on radio, and this is my first dirty secret of the day. Uh, in 1995, I produced the Christmas number two hit single, Wonderwall, by the Mike Flowers Pops. Right? It was kept off the number one that year by Michael Jackson's Earth Song. Now, he might be dead, but to this day, I still bear a massive grudge. <laughs> Just thought I'd share that. Um, ten years after that, I made a series with these guys. And uh, very soon after we finished making the uh, series and a TV pilot, they went to America. And I um, haven't heard from them since. So I. Don't know what happened to them after that. I think they just disappeared. Um, the point I'm making is really that it is never, ever about the technology. It is only really about talent, story, and audiences. Um, obviously, the BBC changed its storytelling mission. So it evolved. Radio, TV, and then online. Now... <clears throat> I earned my first set of stripes in digital media when we launched a new comedy platform on bbc.co.uk. Back then, we strategized that using our archive, our TV shows, and by developing new talent online, we could be the home for UK comedies past, present, and future. So, uh, let's show you some of the things we were doing back then. And if you think things have dated to, since 2008, uh, let me show you how fast uh, comedy has evolved. So um, I'm going to show you a web series uh, and a trail we made for a web series. How arrogant were we, right, making a trail for a web series? So uh, this is the trail. Let's have a look. I have the authority that none of the members of Tic Tac can read or write. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine end up to crossword or... Oops, sorry guys. Oh. Let's go back. I have it on very good authority that none of the members of Take Down can read or write. I mean, can you imagine end up to crossword or lethal fizzle working at compass? It's sad, but many young bands come for a call here and they have no idea how you station it. Let's just go out of the greatest hits. We did it last year, didn't we? Yeah, except we've insisted on no hits on. 
I've wanted to work with animals in this way for years. I get the chance to actually play live underwater with different types of fish. I love you with my love and love, which means she's joking. I'm joking, I was working. <laughs> Um, as I said, that was a trail for a web series we launched on the BBC's uh, bbc.co.uk. Nobody came and watched that at all. All right. Um, so what we did was we published it to YouTube. Even fewer people came to watch it on YouTube. Um, Two years later, that was a six-part series on BBC Two, and it's now in its third series and a Christmas special. All right? It's really important we understand who's making the rules about what you're being asked to make. All right? um, but at the same time as having lots of content that nobody was watching, we were learning quite a lot. Uh, and we did, we did uh, take quite a lot of notice of what people were sharing online, and we did uh, manage a YouTube channel fairly successfully, and then uh, started to make content specifically for YouTube in order to find out uh, what audiences would share. So uh, we devised a different type of comedy, and uh, we worked with the writers in the States, and we came up with an idea for a disaggregated sketch show, which would work on YouTube, and then would aggregate into iPlayer and on broadcast for BBC Three. So let's show you an example of that different type of comedy. Let's see if this plays. Hold on, guys. It's not that small. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Just mm -hmm. play. It's fine. Oh. So what is the iPad? It's whatever you want it to be. photos of your friends. It's five books. It's having what you want, when you want, with a jet block or run. It's talking to your friends. Um, that didn't go to series. 1.5 million views across YouTube and various other platforms. Uh, but TV shows and sketch shows are really hard on television. So in 2012, we were developing TV IP on the internet. BBC One shows like Citizen Khan, film directors like Ben Wheatley were all working with us online before they got their break elsewhere. We were working into a structure that assumed that the job of internet comedy was to develop television comedy. Or to put it another way, our strategy was the internet was there to serve television. But then culture eats strategy for breakfast. Social media blew up, perfect storm occurred. More and more short form video was consumed along with the opportunity to consume increasing with new forms of distribution, especially for a specific demographic. Now in 2015, I was asked to run a session for senior management at the BBC on short form video and why we should get into it. Uh, so rather than uh, do a big presentation, right, I got a YouTuber called Rob Madden, uh, who vlogs as Brett Domino. Uh, he's based up in Sheffield. Uh, so, so we made a short form video 
about the art of short form video. And we've never really published this because we don't have the rights to publish it. But uh, this, this is uh, what we showed senior management at the BBC. So let's talk about YouTube, the huge online phenomenon that gets so many views now. Everybody's wanting them. Six billion hours of video watched every month, thousands of hours uploaded before you've even had your lunch. In fact, in just nine days, more videos uploaded digitally to YouTube than the BBC's entire TV history. It's short form video, everybody's doing it. From big name YouTube bloggers to cats playing music, there's people like Tyrannosaurus Lex, Jack and Finn Harris, who just talk to a camera and have millions of subscribers. This guy just sees weird stuff and people bloody love it. And this girl looks at famous people's makeup and shows you how they've done it. There's music videos, professional and amateur, some of some in ingenuity and some of very low caliber. Like this painstaking effort from the band OK Go compared to the lackluster chromatine monstrosity from this bloke. It's also the perfect format for comedy, from short sketches and songs, mini sitcoms and parodies. In fact, there's an example before the hit BBC One show. Citizen Car began as a series of short online videos. Yet, even the BBC are getting involved in it too, with short form episodes of Sherlock and Doctor Who. I guess people just like watching shorter videos. They can watch them on their laptops, tablets, smartphones. There's even those apps that everybody now seems to be getting, where you can upload and watch videos at just a few seconds. What's the point in that? Just six seconds of data. But some people use five to be incredibly creative. Like the guy who throws a shirt and turns it into his brother, or the guy who pays himself a low budget Harry Potter. It's no wonder big brands have started getting on board. With so many people on their mobile phones watching short form, like Starbucks' Instagram photo video loops, and Hellman's working with Jamie Oliver's channel on YouTube. It's the way of the future. We will digital consumers. Our relationship with video changes more and more. It's the name of this presentation from the British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, he was on Britain's Got Talent briefly, um, and we got him a television pilot as a result of that, and that didn't go to series either. So uh, you can see a pattern emerging in my career, right? Uh, <clears throat> right. Um, in 2015, our world changed quite dramatically, primarily to shore up escalating uh, budget for television drama the decision was made to close our youth television channel, BBC Three, and subsequently relaunch it in February 2016 as an online-only service. Now, the BBC were the first global broadcaster to close a television channel and put it online. In the run-up, everything was under scrutiny, from hybrid long-form video, short-form video strategy to the reinvention of the channel logo. But as storytellers sitting inside the BBC, what was so exciting about this offer was it afforded us a new way to tell stories. Overnight, and specifically inside the television part of the BBC, it legitimised non-broadcast content. Um, our f first big project for BBC Three was a uh, documentary series. As you could probably have guessed, by now I'd lost my sense of humour entirely uh, and, and moved into a different form of storytelling. So uh, this was an attempt to remake the landmark documentary series Life and Death Row. And this was uh, made for, uh, initially it was pitched as an interactive video project uh, informed by some of the work people like the National Film Board of Canada have done. Um, but let me show you the trail for it and then I'll explain a little bit about why this was um, a different form of storytelling for us. Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? 
Um, we were making that two years ago, uh, at the same time that Netflix pushed out Making a Murderer. Uh, and the BBC quite lucky because you have your own big platform and your own uh, places to get content seen, like iPlayer. And that had about three million views I in iPlayer. Um, what was so liberating about making that project was that uh, we were able to take a budget and create a project where we took a TV crew and a TV team and made them work in a completely different way. Um, when I uh, used to make uh, radio shows and we were finishing them in the edit, you used to play something through the smallest speaker in the studio called the dirt box, because you're always editing on massive speakers. And then you play it in order to understand if it will work on a transistor radio. And uh, the edit suite, we had everything in the end we viewed just on a mobile to see if we could make that project work. And that's the reality now of making this form of content for youth audiences. Two years ago, that was a big deal. Now, it's kind of uh, de rigueur, right? Everyone does it. Um, but this is the kind of seismic change that I think BBC Three uh, forced upon the business at large inside the BBC. Uh, with BBC Three's move online, it was no longer a case of using digital to inform television development. It was a case of using the digital behaviours of our audiences to inform content development. And the BBC, which for so many years has been a platform company making content for its TV and radio channels, may have to evolve into a content company that has to work very carefully through its distribution platforms. But how do you make that leap, which for TV broadcasters and most linear storytellers can be fragmented and difficult to navigate? Now, if we assume that the Chinese are right, and if, like me, you believe that the opportunity we have in front of us right now can only be found in understanding the business that we are really in, and that opportunity comes from how we respond positively to change, then here's how I think you can go about building some windmills. <laughs> Last year, we launched the, uh, the Taster platform, and, and this is a home for new ideas at the BBC. Uh, this is where we road test new formats, new technologies, new talent, and we do it in front of the audience. And a lot of these projects are half finished, and they can break. But it's really important we understand how things can scale. Um, this is another video. This is just a handful of the projects that we did last year, and an indicator as to why Taster exists and what we use it for.
Um, we're not alone in wanting to understand what the future of storytelling looks like. I think it's really, really important we form a coalition of the willing around people who have an active interest in understanding where story is going. And we share our technologies and we share our capabilities with people like you. All right? Um, what we're learning, though, is that uh, what we're doing on Taster, which it's important, it's, it's a website, it's a badge, it's a way we get analytics, right? Uh, what we're learning is that you don't pilot single ideas. Um, you identify digital behaviors. You laser in on what makes people share content. You license a new technology, you develop a new digital format, and then you repeatedly pilot it with many different teams till you know if what you've produced truly can scale. Now, take, for example, the idea of uh, personalized content. On television, we all see the same program, right? But online, we can create something just for you. Last year, we developed an archive engine, and we populated it with hundreds of clips from our archive, and we tagged them very carefully. And then we invited the audience to tell their story with our archive. Uh, and one of the ways we did that was around the charter renewal debate. And in a minute, I'm going to try and do the thing you should never do, which is a live demo. But let's remind ourselves of the kind of propaganda we were, we were throwing at you last year. I should really salute. Um, <coughs> right, now, let's see if I can, uh, oops. I might need to borrow you for this. Uh, oh, hold on, let's see. Okay, uh, 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 right, now, let's see if this will work. Um, Helga, yeah. could you possibly, let's, let, right, so, hold on, you can lie, <laughs> think about it, think about it, right, okay, let. You've watched the advert, right? You watch that lovely piece of propaganda. And then on air, the continuity announcer says, oh, go to URL slash BBC Your Moments, right? And this is what you land on. This is the landing page. So, Helga. Come on, then. Yeah, yeah. You can lie. Yes, I was going to say, no. Come on. 1974? It's 664, but... Let's do 74. Just because <laughs> you said it first. Oh, no. All right. This is why you should never do live demos. I think we might, we might be in a... No, it's all right. Let's try again. I'm going to give it one more go. I think this might be the IE, but let's see. Ah, bugger. Okay. Hey? Loading. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll come back to it. Anyway, um, if it does work, I'll come back to it. It's, uh, it's a personalized uh, story. It allows us to tell the, your, your story, uh, and it'll throw out the first Radio Times, uh, the Christmas Radio Times. It'll throw out clips of children's television programs when you were going up. It's really, really important we understand the opportunity in front of us around personalized content and personalization. Most of you may now know you have to log in to get access to iPlayer or Radio Player. And that isn't necessarily a sneaky trick to try and find out if you're paying your license fee. It's the desire to create a personalized service and to drive everything via recommendation, which platforms like Net Netflix do so well. Um, so let's just pretend that worked uh, and move on. Now, the annual costs of running the taster operation is less than a single episode of one of our premium TV dramas, right? Doctor Who costs more than running that platform for a year. The value of doing it lies in our ability to anticipate and respond. Um, this is kind of runs opposite to a way a lot of television and big media works. Um, now, 
as I said, these kinds of models exist only to help you deliver your purpose. And if you're fortunate enough to have your purpose writ large for all to see, then you really should understand the business you're in and how you can respond positively to change. Now, in an organisation that has to find another £800 million worth of cost savings by 2022, the idea of responding positively to change can get lost as we fall back on what we know and we retreat to high water. So I'm going to make my own contribution to these cost savings by leaving the BBC later this year. Um, I believe that if you are in the business of story, we now have the most amazing tools at our disposal. And if we understand and we truly understand what it means to work digitally, we can elevate our purpose and tell stories in ways we could never have previously imagined. Now, like you, I'm sure uh, we all struggle sometimes with uh, the idea of what it means to work digitally. And I use this definition, which is uh, from Tom Lusmore. Tom Lusmore is a very, very smart man. Uh, he was instrumental in the setting up of the government's digital service, and he now works for the co-op. Uh, and you should follow him on Twitter if you're not already. Um, at the moment, I'm working with the Department of Culture, Media and Sport on a project that we hope will forge a new partnership between the UK's cultural and digital industries. And the business of story has to sit at the heart of that partnership. Stories like Jeremy Deller's, we're here because we are here. 1st of July last year, 1,500 volunteers dressed in First World War uniform appeared unexpectedly in locations up and down the UK to commemorate the centenary of the Battle of the Somme. 340 million impressions on social media. 63% of the UK adult population were aware of this historic public artwork. If you know the business you knew are in, you can use the internet to respond to people's raised expectations. I think Sarah's here from the RSC. Another example of this would be the RSC's production of The Tempest, using amazing technology. Uh, it's at the Barbican. If you can get a chance to go see it, please do. Um, another example, the Forever Project. I'm not going to tell you too much about the Forever Project. It was on the video when you came in, but uh, please bear with this. This is, um, I think this is remarkable. <laughs> For the best part of the century, they lived quietly amongst us. I was born in 1932. Journey in Berlin. Brussels, in Belgium, in February 1940. Men and women sharing their powers. Many perturbation. Why? I stayed alive. Took the story. The power to move. It's such a, a powerful thing to hear. Inspire. The people come after me. I want to shake my hand. I know they want to help me. Guide. And teach. Don't discriminate against other people. Think for yourself. Don't listen to propaganda. The power to open eyes. Transform lives. Change their future. Spark their imagination. The power to build a better, kinder, safer. If you see anything being done which is wrong, like bullying, speak up. Ordinary men and women with extraordinary strengths. If only they also have the power of immortality. We shouldn't be here anymore. I do find the energy draining from me. Now, through the power of 3D technology, we can all stories alive. Keep our words alive. And try to make the world a little bit better. Because these are the men and women who know the truth about mankind. Once you dehumanize a group of people, even animals are kind of to each other. I can never imagine myself scared for my life. A truth that needs to live Come out, touched and moved by the experience. Hopefully, it will leave a legacy. It's quite an incredible project. Truth. 
Preserving the stories of Holocaust survivors by turning them into interactive 3D holograms only happens if you elevate your purpose, you respond positively to change, and you know the business you are really in. Now, I was told when doing presentations like this, uh, the best thing you can do is, is have a takeout for attendees, right? Three pieces of advice. So uh, this won't come as a surprise to many of you who, uh, to, who work in the landscape of content. But the teams that work with me, if they want to make anything or develop a proposition that, that we need to work or publish digitally, um, I ask them three questions. And if they can answer three questions, we progress it. So um, question number one, is it mobile? Question number two, is it social? Question number three, can it scale? This is why. Uh, you don't need to dwell, dwell on it too long. There's only one guy there, all right? Not as the mobile. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being so generous with your time. Thank you for that, Will. Um, I'll be taking questions in a moment, um, but if you, actually, if there's, if there's a help, is Chris around? Chris is going to helpfully pass mics around. Uh, thank you. Uh, Will, thanks so much for that. It's always fantastic to see um, what organisations who are taking this on can do. But my question actually is back to your lovely, you know, the vine of the guy who could fly like Harry Potter. Yeah. And the vine, you know, the other amazing, you know, turned his T-shirt into a son, into a little boy. Now, my question is about trusted brokers, because how many hours of vines do you have to watch before you get that one good one? Isn't part of the issue that most of us need a recommendation machine, uh, you know, some form of person who's going to look through all that, because there's some crap out there. There's, some, there's lots of, pardon my French, there's lots of very low quality material out there. And then there's a few gems. So how do we, who haven't got time to do that, how do we get the good stuff and less the rubbish stuff? Um, Is that fair? Yeah, that's my question. It's quite interesting that uh, so much of what's successful on the internet, there are so many platforms that do, do nothing. They make nothing, right? They're just amazing curators. Um, just trying to think, right? Upworthy. Does anyone... Uh, Sign up to Upworthy, or it doesn't make a thing, as far as I'm aware. It only curates. Um, and I think uh, one of the things to do is to uh, find out who the good curators are. And we all uh, probably, in the room, I'm guessing, uh, have a few uh, newsletters we subscribe to. Um, I'm thinking of, because my job is essentially to try and work out what we should be doing in digital media. I, I sign up to a variety of things. I follow, um, I've forgotten the name of the guy, but he works for a VC called ben, uh, Anderson Horowitz. And there's a guy called Benjamin, I've forgotten his name, I'll, I'll tell you all later. But um, every Monday he sends out a newsletter with the most amazing <coughs> stats about what's happening, primarily in mobile. And increasingly he's now thinking about AI. Um, but that's, the, the art is, is in knowing who to follow <laughs> and what newsletters to sign up to. And you, you're all on Facebook, you're all on Twitter, probably. Uh, it's, it's knowing what to sign up to. And I think what's interesting about the role for the BBC going forward it is just that. We, we need trusted curators. We need people that we, that we uh, like online because we know what they deliver us we can trust. And we know that it's not going to be someone populating the internet with more and more crap. Um, so I think... It's down to a bit of hard work on your part. <laughs> well, so one thing that could be helpful is if any of you have any of those trusted curators, your go-to places to know what's going on, uh, by all means share it on Twitter, use the hashtag, and then we can all find them. But I think you're, it's not just 
people who can fly like Harry Potter and magic tricks that we need trusted curators for. I'm thinking fake news. You know, there's all sorts of places where the abundance of information now makes that role even more important. Have we got questions from the audience? Time for just one or two, so we can make back a bit. Don't be shy. Yes, Lee, if you just wait for the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wrote this down, and perhaps you've already maybe considered it. Um, I think what you are doing is fantastic in engaging your audience base and actually giving them an opportunity to make their own decisions on, um, on the content that they're being shown. But are we in danger of utopianizing potential areas that offer echo chamber ideologies? And so if we are constantly allowing people to develop and experience a space where it's only seeing what they like, are we losing out on chances where we might be able to cross-pollinate ideas? Um, I, th I think that's... I think you're reflecting on a conversation that is about, uh, like you say, echo chambers, fake news, all that kind of stuff. And I think the idea of democratising content and democratising culture is a separate conversation. And I think uh, what I hope the Taster platform represents and what I hope we may see more of going forward is an expression that we are no longer a culture that really passively consumes. We do passively consume, right? We all passively consume. We all know that when we watch telly, we generally watch telly to passively consume. But uh, content and the notion of what culture is, is now something completely different. And I think it's really, really important that we operate in a landscape where we're not asking people to simply be consumers. We're asking people to develop in a relationship where they can co-create. We're asking people, do they want us to do this or don't they want us to do this? Especially where we're spending public money, right? I really think the idea of cultural democracy is increasingly important. And what platforms like Taster show around the, something like the BBC and licence fee is we really need to hear from people who are paying for the BBC around what the BBC should be making and what we could be scaling and what could work, and what they might want to see more of, and what they might want to see less of. I think that's the kind of debate, and that's one of the great things that, you, that the internet has made possible. And I think a lot of organisations need to get up to speed with that. OK. Thank you. Another question. <clears throat> Dr Hart. Thank you, Helga. Um, uh, Dave Hart from Birmingham City University. Um, obviously, in the BBC, you work in a highly politicised environment, actually, and actually, uh, you, uh, I imagine the BBC are quite relieved that we've got a government that are perhaps less powerful, powerfully situated than they were. Um, I wondered if you ever had to come up against the tension about what's, what's the role of the private sector in innovating in this space and how that impinges on the BBC's role here, because there's been a political view, actually, that the BBC shouldn't be in this space, it should be either leaving it well alone on a wall, we'll all just watch Country File and have the Today programme. And those are the kind of programmes the BBC should be doing. And this kind of innovation should actually be left to the private sector, or the BBC facilitates the private sector in doing that. You must have felt that kind of political pressure because the BBC circumstances are quite particular. I think, I think uh, yes, is the answer to the question. There, is, there are always pressures. I think, uh, also, bear in mind, the BBC is a shrinking organisation, right? Uh, as I said, there's 800 million pounds worth of cost savings to be found. This is not an organisation that can make bold statements and make great advances into new, air, into new arenas right now. I think um, there are areas that the BBC's kind of, I suppose, had its fingers burnt when it developed a strategy around educational software and was seen to impinge on the market and had to retreat. But actually, I can say this because I'm leaving, but I think the BBC is a force for good in this landscape. I think that in... Uh, an environment where my children now navigate uh, content willy-nilly, I don't necessarily want to put them in the hands of Facebook's algorithm or in what Google decides you want to see. If I'm going to put my kids in front of something online, I'm pretty confident I can trust what the BBC offers my children online. And I don't necessarily want to put my hands or my kids' hands in the future of great big American monolithic corporations who want to be ad-serving mechanisms more than they want to be anything else. Um, and therefore, I think the role the BBC has is a truly important role and a very valuable role online. And I think it's very interesting to see how the EU have been proactive recently 
in terms of uh, demanding that Netflix grows its content from inside the EU. I think it's really interesting. I think we're going to hear a tip, hit a tipping point quite soon as to the acceptance of big platforms as media organisations. Then the regulation framework around them changes, and all of a sudden we're in a landscape where uh, a lot more might be possible. And of course, those organisations are going to resist that change as hard as they can. Uh, so I think the BBC generally is a force for good. And I think in terms of how it operates going forward commercially, it's increasingly important that it does do this because so much of the world we're going into is gated. So, for example, the idea of virtual reality. Virtual reality is a generally a gated experience navigated through by either Facebook and Oculus or HTC and so on. If the BBC is going to enter into that space and try and work through that space, it will need, to a certain extent, commercial money because... Again, it's just my opinion, so don't say the BBC says, it's just me. Um, I think there's a danger in spending too much public service money on content that not enough people can see. And I think there's a real valuable role for VR going forward, hugely valuable role. But I think that's something that I'd like to get Google to help pay for, or HTC to help pay for, because it's their bloody platform, right? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, just a quick jargon like VR, you'll hear it a few times today, virtual reality. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. Don't sorry. Worry. No, no, that's sorry. my job. That's okay. I'm here to un unpack acronyms. Um, I'm afraid we're going to probably move on because we had a little bit of a late start, but um, can we just take one more moment? Blue, blue, electric blue, that's the colour of his shirt. Can we thank uh, Will, Will Saunders? Thanks.